So this is a lot. I like Zoom a lot better. All right. Welcome everyone to this month's Conveners.org member call. Um, we're going to be discussing inclusion in the workplace today and how to engage and retain your team. Uh, the discussion will be led by Josh Smith from Green Mountain Support Services. Uh, and let's get into it. So, well, but right before we get started, for those of you who may not know who we are and what we do, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction um, before we get rolling on the conversation here. Uh, we are a global virtual team. We have both uh, core team members and a suite of consultants um, all over the globe. Uh, I'm personally based in Guatemala City. Colin, my colleague who's joining me on the call today, is in Canada. And then we have uh, team members in other parts of the world. Um, we've always been 100% virtual. So if, you know, I, you know, one of the things we might be talking about today uh, connected to the theme of the call is, you know, how to manage your community as, as in your team virtually. Um, never been a problem for us because we've always been virtual, uh, but I know Josh will have things to share about that. And so um, a little bit about us and what we do and what our work looks like. We um, do work that falls into two main buckets. One is our membership community and one is our advisory services arm. Our advisory services arm is more like our consulting services where we do contracts with large universities, foundations, corporate corporations. Um, really around either like co-designing, building, or leading any type of convening event uh, training series. Um, so we've done everything from facilitating a training series to actually like co-designing an, an, an event. Um, and then for our membership community, our membership community is a global community of what we call purpose first conveners. And so these are organizations that are dedicated to bringing others together into a common space to create um, sustainable, actionable impact. Um, and this can look like a variety of different um, organizations all across the impact ecosystem, all across the globe. So um, for example, impact accelerators like Echoing Green, Miller Center, um, Unreasonable, as well as impact investors or investment funds um, like Conscious Capitalism, we also have uh, philanthropic organizations and nonprofits like Feeding America. Um, and then we also have like coaching training and even digital storytelling media support and event production services like JV Media Group, Caspian Agency. So if, if you're an organization or individual, because we also have individual uh, members, team of one um, who've joined us, please feel free to reach out to me. Colin can put my email in the chat and I'd love to talk to you more about um, you joining our community. And so upcoming calls that we have, um, we have one last call for this year, which will be another member call. Um, we have member calls every third Thursday of the month, um, pending you know any sort of events that may lead us to move the call, but they're usually around um, either 1 p.m. Pacific or um, once a quarter, we do calls earlier or later to just en encompass uh, different types of time zones. And so uh, in December, we'll have a call around weaving wellness, which will be led by Indy. Um, and Indy has a lot of experience doing sort of uh, wellness conversations. So if you are a member or would like to become a member, we invite you to come and join us December 16th um, at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And for today, um, so those for those of you who haven't joined us on a member call before, we do welcome and intros, which we just did. Um, we do a community connection or community activity for 10 minutes every time. And then uh, we pass it off to our guest Spark presenter, who is Josh Smith. I'll be introducing him in a second. And then we have a, a closing if there's time, but usually discussion kind of rolls over to the top of the hour. So I'm going to pause there really quickly. And we're going to do a community connection here. Um, I'm going to stop my share so I can see all of you. Great. So, Colin, I think we have enough people actually to do small groups if you want. Sure. Um, one, two, three, four, five, maybe one group of two and one group of three. Mm -hmm. um, unless, let me just see, because Josh, would you like to join a group or would you like to stay back with us? No, I can I can stay back. I had a that that works. It's fine. Okay, cool. So, um, well, actually, in that case, 
let's let's share in the main group con sorry i'm gonna just switch we're, we're always very flexible on these calls based on who shows up um if more people show up then we'll we'll ask them to share later <laughs> and not during this this time um because we have a 10 minute time frame here so the prompt is if you could learn one new skill personal or professional what would it be um mine i have one top of mine that i've really uh wanted to to do for a while and it's kind of random but a, uh, I guess it could be personal or professional. I've always wanted to learn how to make croissants. Um, I love them a lot. So it might be a dangerous uh, thing to learn because I already know how to make bagels. So it would be going on to the, the bread shelf of things that I can <laughs> make at home. But I have, I have heard um, that you need like a special machine to make sure you get all the layers um, of, the, of the croissant. Otherwise they're too doughy. And I'm actually a I'm very, very picky when it comes to croissants um, because I have been to France. And once you <laughs> have a croissant in, in France, it's not the same. So uh, anywhere else, rad, basically. So um, yeah, I'd love to just learn how to make a butter croissant. Very simple. Um, so does anyone else want to go personal professional skill you've ever wanted to learn? It can be anything. All right, Florence, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, croissant, just, I, I want to just like start right now. <laughs> but um, now I want to uh, learn to play guitar. And uh, full disclosure, during at the beginning of the pandemic, I did go online and, and did like a few lessons and then it didn't last very much. So it's still, it will happen sometime, someday. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Florence. How about Kenny? I'm going to just call on you. Hello. Um, I didn't have a clear answer, but actually, there we go. Lighting. Um, this, so I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee now, and it's surrounded by mountains. And I grew up in, I grew up in the Midwest, so very flat. But everyone here climbs. Um, and this weekend, I'm going bouldering for the first time. So uh, either I'll get terrible calluses on my hand, or I'll find find a new new passion. So I think I'm going to learn a bit about technical climbing this weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Kenny. Annabelle, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am really interested in taking dance lessons uh, during the pandemic. It's something my partner and I would do kind of in the kitchen, um, but excited to kind of learn more formal um, dance structure. So leaning into that now. Any particular style that you're interested in? Ooh, advanced question. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think just <laughs> probably salsa, um, maybe starting with that and then building off from there. Um, so I've done more like individual like Zumba classes and things like that, but less so partner dancing, so. Awesome, thanks. Connor, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I would love to learn how to paint. Um, it would be so cool to go on a hike and see something beautiful and just be able to paint that would be incredible. Perfect. Thanks, Connor. Ifoma, can you hear us now? Are you connected to audio? Do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I think I would like to learn French. I'd like to learn to speak French. Awesome. Yeah. That was my pandemic skill as well. Another one with Duolingo. So I can say random phrases, but they're not very useful for actual conversations. <laughs> like <laughs> I am a woman. It doesn't really come up in common conversation. So Colin, would you like to go? Uh, yeah, mine would also be an instrument similar to Florence. Um, I would like to learn how to play the cello. I've always loved the cello. It's a weird instrument, but I thought about doing it at the beginning of the pandemic as well. But our house that we uh, live in is very old. The walls are thin and we have tenants below us and I really didn't want them to move out. So I decided <laughs> not to. <laughs> That's so sweet of you, Colin. I'm sure your neighbors are, would be very grateful if they knew about that. And Josh. Wrap us up. I, I, so for, for me, it's uh, I'm learning, a, trying to learn a lot on just how to like do yard work, not like how to mow a lawn or anything, but like 
for the longest time, I didn't know the difference between a perennial and an annual until my English teacher from high school says per annual, meaning per year. So it's always there every year. I'm like, oh, you know, so it's so it's so it's one of those things. So this, you know, figuring out, you know, what to plant. So I've been, you know, learning that. But from a technical perspective as well, uh, teaching myself in design to do uh, how to like design books and stuff is uh, um always been a passion of mine I've, I've self-published some books from uh, cartoons I've done in the past and you know you know give them to my friends and family for Christmas presents because it's easy because it seems like but uh but yeah so yeah and now being it so making it more professional looking is what I'm trying to teach myself so yeah yeah awesome well thank you all for sharing um I'm going to quickly just share my screen one more time and just so I can introduce our guest spark for today, which I think I might have, I think it got skipped over maybe. There he is. Okay. So our guest spark today is uh, Josh Smith. He's the executive director of Green Mountain Support Services. And uh, just wanted to give him a little shout out before handing the mic over. And also just as a caveat or addition, I guess, um, our calls, we do really, really want them to be highly participatory and engaging. So please feel free to raise your hand, either virtually or if you have your camera on, um, or post in the chat any questions you have. This is meant to be more of a conversation and sharing uh, resources and knowledge um, across all of our organizations. And, and Josh is sort of holding the space and sharing his perspective and expertise with us. But um, we're all we're all experts um, in different ways, shapes, and forms. So please don't feel free that you need to just sit and listen. If you want to do that too, and just learn, that's totally fine as well, but just as a, an addition to that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and I'm going to pass it to Josh to get us kicked off in our discussion today. Thank you so much again for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Also just to out of the introduction for me, it's like for those, uh, this means uh, something to something to some, but nothing to most. I'm an eighth generation Vermonter. So I've, so it's like one of those things where um, anybody that's in Vermont, it means something, but everybody else in that doesn't mean anything. But I, uh, it's, I, I had my work just to give you a, a quick history of me. I, uh, uh, I worked about 15 years overseas for Peace Corps and Doctors Without Borders, um, came back and got my, uh, so a lot of work, a lot of work I did in uh, uh, the field of the you know, international and you know, international relief work. Uh, fell in love with it. Um, met my wife there. She's a Nigerian. That was the last place we did an urban maternity healthcare clinic. Um, just had our this past uh, this past Sunday. We just had our ninth wedding anniversary. So uh, um, always happy to, happy about that. I mean, my my previous relationship was six months. So I mean, I, I guess <laughs> figured it out by now. Uh, and I uh, got, got my MBA. I um, uh, got a, a MBA and that's going to help me a lot with my just kind of like the direction and vision that I that had. And I was very fortunate enough to find a job that I truly love and appreciate um, in my home state. So being close to family is, um, is always exciting. Um, and, and one of the things when I first started working here, so I've been in this position as the executive director for about uh, six years. And one of the things when I first talked was first start, started talking to Sarah about this of, of especially during COVID, um, all the agencies that we, so Green Mountain Support Services, what we do is we provide community-based services for people living with disabilities. Doesn't matter what kind of disability, um, intellectual disabilities, uh, brain injuries. So disabilities that people get from, you know, the happenstance of life. Um, and also we work with people with disabilities that we say that people get through the benefits of age. Um, disability is a natural part of the human experience. And so we work with our senior population and our mission is uh, ensuring that people are still at home in their community, making sure that we as, an, a, we as an agency, we don't believe in congregate settings. We don't believe in segregated settings. We believe everybody should be connected and living in the environment in the, in the community they wanna be a part of. Um, and we work based off of people, not diagnoses. So, um, and, really been focusing on that. And needless to say, we always hear about this issues of, you know, the great resignation. Um, uh, we're one of about 20 agencies in Vermont that provide this type of services. And all the other agencies are, they see between 60 to 120% turnover rate. And 
we and we see everybody's hiring. We in Greenmount Support Services, we had nobody quit. We had nobody leave um, throughout that. We've had we have about 120 staff right now. Mm-hmm. Nobody throughout the entire process ever left. And and I feel super bad with my colleagues of other agencies there who are suffering a lot and they're um, you know they're scrambling. They don't know what to do and. Uh, uh, it's one of those positions where I feel like I got to be there to help support them um, and do what we can. We actually kind of lease out, rent out some of our employees for them, uh, for them to work, uh, to make sure they're at least staying above water, especially when you're working with that uh, environment. And so what I want to do is kind of talk to you about a conversation of what we did um, and what worked for us. And what I'll do is try to give you some points of um, things that that we've that the advice that I've given other agencies that they've been able to implement immediately um, to help kind of stem the tide and things that are almost an investment piece that uh, that that worked really well for us. So I'm going to be sure. So please, please, please call me out if I talk in generalities or um, I, I <laughs> sometimes I got to say uh, say what worked for us and not necessarily saying that this is a fix all for anything. But hopefully what I can do is I have a pretty extensive list. Some of these things are that you might be able to uh, utilize or or talk to some of your peers or colleagues to say, um, have you tried this? Some of them are easy fixes. Some of them are um, more investments that you, that, uh, uh, that could possibly see um, higher retention later. So um, without further ado, then, sir, I can just jump right into it and just kind of talk about what uh, what we were able to do previously. I'd say like five years ago, that starting that starting that established that was able to put some things in place for us. Um, one of the things that we did was, and and I see this pers- personally. I, I view myself as as a as a director of an agency. Is I don't serve people who are living with disabilities. My job is to serve my employees so they can serve people living with disabilities. So for instance, I talked to one of my, one of my friends. I'm also small town in Vermont. Everybody wears a lot of hats. He's also the president of their, our local chamber of commerce. <laughs> so um, one of the pieces that I gave is uh, we, have a, we have a lady who uh, runs a coffee shop great coffee shop and some of the best donuts in town and uh, and you know amazing amazing like omelets that you look at it you know you're gonna have a heart attack because they're just you know it's full of everything that you shouldn't be eating and they're delicious and she's struggling I mean she has people coming in every day so it's not an issue of that she doesn't have the customers people keep leaving her employees keep leaving and and one of my and one of my advices that I gave to her says you know how to cook everything. You do everything, uh, but you. It's so like that. The, the the piece of advice that I get that I that I said try it is um, just su- supervise your staff and let them do everything. And there's a point of ownership, especially for small businesses or other people, is like is holding onto that mission and feeling as though that you're irreplaceable. Then makes you then 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 could create an opportunity for. You, that a person does become irreplaceable of, a, of an owner of a place is because they, nobody else can do it just as well as you can. So, so, one, so one advice that I've, so one of the things that I've done when I first got here was making sure that I, that I trained, you know, trained, but just supported those frontline workers, you know, supported those frontline staff and making sure that they were actually, um, they had everything they needed and they knew they felt as though that they weren't, just a cog in a wheel that um, they were valued. And there's a few things that we did for first off, right out the gate that we did is, is, is it's, you know, it's first of all, kind of retraining my leadership team to be serving the employees, not serving the, not serving our, our stakeholders, whatever they be, if that was, you know, like that customer base. Um, and that took a, that took a bit of time to put that in place. Um, the other thing that we did is having this, this mantra that was ingrained into everybody is family first, work second. Uh, that it was, it was very clear as like nobody. And, you know, my, my, uh, my older brother, he's a funeral director. He's never met anybody or anything in, uh, that wish they spent more time at work. And, 
and this is a thing that I would tell people is like, listen, you know what? If something happens to me tomorrow, you'll find another executive director. If something happens to me tomorrow, my kids aren't going to get another dad. Like that's just, you got to prioritize what's important in your life. And reflecting those values as an organization is that we are not, we are not your, you know, for me, from the executive director saying this, um, we are not your priority. Your priority is your friends and your family. So prior to prioritize that. And that was another aspect, like implementing that and, and really reinforcing working in, you know, a nonprofit, you know, a, you know, a publicly funded non nonprofit, there's a sense of martyrism there's a sense of they're heroes and and i keep pulling back is like you are not a martyr you're not a hero those are words we use so we can so that we can publicly explain that we can pay you cheaper we can pay you less because we give you that title that you do this is a the work you're doing is a professional work the work you're doing is is important but it's also it's also um you need to be able to survive off of that you need to have a live a, a livable wage and the challenge that we have is because we're publicly funded the money we're given is budgeted by our state legislator so it's it's a bit tricky on that so we always try to find different ways to show our our value for the value and respect for them which gets to my other point is uh it's extremely hard and it should not be the and, and, and I'm, I'm talking generalities. It is not my job to make my employees happy. Happiness is subjective, and happiness means different things for. But I. But the piece that I hold is that it's important for me to make sure that all employees feel valued and respected. And there's that can be measured. That can be a measurable thing, by objectively speaking. Uh, for us, we are showing, objectively speaking, by reassuring that the communication is there, reassuring when we have committee board, we have board committees, making sure that our frontline workers, there's representation on every aspects of decision making that happens. And being very clear is that there's a difference between, there's a difference between asking permission and asking for feedback, because that got really confusing when I first started rolling out having our frontline workers, you know, attend these meetings is they're like, well, we didn't agree to that. So just to be very clear, it's like we need feedback and advice. And then there are, there are times where I had to get permission from them because almost like, quote unquote, they call it a buy in. It's like, what do you think about? And then trying to for that that aspects of it. So that was another piece that implementing this five years ago really helped us moving forward is is and is reassuring that engaging all aspects of our employees are 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 feel valued and respected um and and the other the other part too is that we, i got a lot of pushback when we first started when i first started kind of rolling out some of these initiatives was well that's not how we that's not how we usually do it that's not how it's done here i know you're new but this isn't how we do it and my question always came back is like if it's not regulatory and if it's not person centered, meaning the person that we provide services for, it's a term we use, um, we got to ask why we're doing it. There could be a reason. There could be a really good reason, but uh, challenging my senior leadership to always ask, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it like this? Um, and about half of the things that were always done in a certain way ended up, we're able to readdress it and change it. Uh, based off of the fact that it it was an antiquated policy that really didn't make any sense anymore. So we just really reevaluated all of those standard operating procedures to see if they um, if the people that were are those stakeholders were directly affected by it, then what were those some of those points um, to readdress them and and having those people that you know are frontline workers uh, part of recreate uh, rewriting some of those points. Um, the, you know, the, the other piece too, when it came to, uh, what we wanted to do for our staff, because this is the, the traditional hierarchy of, all right, you start off as this frontline worker, you go up to here. And one of the things is that we also implemented and started was a, the traditional step up of where you go from here. You know, do you, 
from this point, you go to this point. But this is an idea that I, that I, that I read from like a Harvard Business Review article is making sure creating specialty positions. Because one piece is like finding out what you need as an agency and deciding where you're going, like where, what steps are you going for that? So that's another idea is, is getting rid of this idea of this pyramid. Like if in order to go up to here, in order to get it paid more, you got to go to here. You have to be a man. If you're in front line, go to be a manager, go from here. But also looking at, are there any different specialties within agencies that, or, or, or companies that don't exist yet? So in order to help retain employees, find out what they're passionate about. And what we've done is we've, we've created a dementia specialist. We've created a, uh, we've created a brain injury specialist. We've created different specialty positions that were able to um, retain folks who didn't want to be a manager. Uh, because being a manager, I've noticed, is a complete set of skills that are involved in actually doing a, a job that somebody was doing before. So being able to take away those boundaries of that idea of this traditional step up, we were able to remove. Um, so so some, these were some of the points that we were able to do to actually create the foundation of, of the culture of the agency. So family first, making sure that people have value, feel valued and respected. Those are foundationals. And those are, those are, those are important to put into place before we threw in the frosting on the cake, as I like to say. And these are some of these side things that I was able to put in put into place to give give folks some uh, to give some give folks some some points. And, and a lot of it too is outward facing in. So one thing that we were able to do is I'll do the big the, the big stuff first. The big stuff I think is always fun. So one of the big things that we did is like for our we we have two types of staff. We have our exempt staff and our non-exempt staff, meaning staff that are paid hourly and, and staff that are paid by, by a salary. So one of the things that we did for our salaried staff was create, we all heard about it. Uh, as far as I know, I'm still the only agency in Vermont that has done it. And this was about five years ago. We started doing unlimited vacation. So Basically, the people people ask a lot of questions. A lot of the feedback I've gotten about a lot of questions, like, "How did you do unlimited vacation?" So basically, going based off of because the lot of looks I get when I first in, uh, introduced it, uh, people are like, "This is a Trojan horse. Josh is going to make us work more. I think he's going to make us work more." So no, two two major things that we did to really re, re reinforce the 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 truism of family first, work second. So one of them is like, this is a thing about, this is a thing about vacation time. And I, 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 gotta, I advise everybody to get rid of vacation time because basically when you look at it, vacation time is earning points to be with your family. That's what it is. It's like, hey, all right, you know what? I just worked another day. I get another hour I can spend with my family. It's so eliminating, eliminating saving up vacation time. First of all, financially speaking, it's, uh, you have to hold it on your finances. So having that time, um, you know, secondly, it gives, it gives people a sense of ownership, like this is my time. So they're less flexible and wanting to, you know, Hey, can I, if you're going to work this way, we're talking to their colleagues and I work that. So that's the other two things. And, and, and the, and the other piece is, um, as I, you know, as I say, it, it's, there, there's that financial burden that's on there. And people also use it as a bank because they feel as though, I can't leave now because I saved up all this vacation time and I'm going to lose it. So it's almost a, it's like holding your employees hostage. So what, what, what I did is uh, I, you know, I talked to my board about it first and uh, they, they, I said, we're going to pay. So what we're going to do is we're going to pay everybody out their vacation time. They're saved up vacation time. They're like I have 50%, 75%. No, all of it paid all out. It's already on our books. Just give it to them. They thought they could save it, give it all to them, give it every single money they earned, give it to them. And, and then from there, I said, and then, and then from there, what I did is I, uh, we, 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 we paid it off. Uh, we paid everybody out and said, all right, so I don't want you, and I said this to my employees, I don't want you to have to pick be between having to save, you know, you know, take a vacation this summer to go out camping or save that time to, to for Christmas and Thanksgiving for your in-laws. Do both, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. As long as your work's done, damn. Because here's the other thing. 
clock watchers. We're not, I, it's the thing. I, I don't want to have to pay you to stay, you, you know, watching the clock and wait to get home and then wait and watch cat videos on YouTube until four o'clock comes around and then get to go home. When your work's done, go home. It's, you know, we're now in COVID. It's like when your work's done, turn off your computer. People can work from home now. It doesn't matter. And so there's two things that we implemented that really reinforce this. One is that we, we said, all right, so supervisors cannot send emails to the people they supervise past 5 p.m. and on the weekends. So, and that's, and, you know, we, 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 we watch that. So they know that's, that's, a, that's a policy we enforce is if they want to send you an email, fine, no problem. They can do that. They can send you an email. It's not a big deal. Don't respond because you know why? you're not working. <laughs> so we want to, we want to make sure that it's, that it's, you know, it's like, it's a, it's an umbra, it's a, my father always has this riddle, what can go up a chimney to down, but not down a chimney up an umbrella. So that's basically the email policy on there. It's the umbrella and a chimney policy. They can send you an email, but you can't send them an email after five or on the weekends. Um, in case of emergencies, they're like, you know what, that's why we have an on-call system. If you have an on-call system, then that's fine. And that's, um, and that, that works out really well. Um, the other thing is we do not track anybody's vacation time that's been over 80 hours per year. So that's 80 hours, that's 80 hours, that's two weeks. So basically we don't know who's been on, who, who's taken time off that's 81 hours, or we don't know, or 800 hours doesn't matter because we want to reinforce the fact that the unlimited vacation at a minimum they need to take at least two weeks off a year and we don't track past 80 hours that reinforces the fact of like we're serious about the unlimited vacation you still it's not like and this is the opinion we were saying it's not like you say you know i don't feel like going to work today i'm just gonna take the day off I mean, you still have to get permission from your supervisor to take time off but what you can't do is just but but what we what we really want to reinforce is that uh, that the unlimited vacation piece is, uh, is that it's not some Trojan horse thing where you can't take it. And so for this, for the sake of fairness and equity, what we did for our hourly staff is that we gave them all uh, six, six weeks of pay time off a year. And it's the same thing. It's use it or lose it. It refreshes at the, at the beginning of every year. So there's no banking of vacation time. There's none of that issues. And to reinforce how important it is to take at least two weeks off. And I'm sure a lot of you are guilty of not taking two weeks off in a row. And if you have, good, keep it up. Because your first week, you start to relax. Your second week, you relax. So what we do is that we actually, we actually pay our staff $200. We give them a check for $200 if they take two weeks off in a row. Before they show up, we're like, taking two weeks off in a row? Come by the office. We're gonna we're gonna give you a check for two hundred dollars. It reinforces that importance of that. And this is the other thing too. Is like it's I'm gonna give you some I'm gonna give you some more little small things. And that's what it comes out at the end of the day. It's the small things that people stay for. It's not. It's the same thing where people say the big things. Um, uh, people don't stress out like the big things are like this is big. It's the small things that will will break you. Same thing. It's the small things. That that reinforce that that importance. Uh, so that's what we did on there. The 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 other thing too, and this is this is the this is the other this is the other piece too, is people want to brag about where they work. People want to brag. About, there again, I'm talking generalities. I have found that people like to brag about where where in, in, where where they work. And so what we do is we utilize our our social media as an internal communication because people see what do you do that so you don't obviously like send emails through like facebook posts but say hey everybody don't forget to sign up for your health you know we got to do your health this is this time of year to send your health care and don't forget these are all your health care benefits people see that on facebook and like what this is amazing you know and like reminding people hey don't forget you got to sign up forget those two weeks off and i'll give you a check for two hundred dollars utilize these things where people are like this is ridiculous how are they surviving and the question comes in is like and this is the piece where i would get feedback from um my colleagues like how do you pay for all of this we you get the same budget as i do my response is always 
on average, it costs us, I don't know about you agencies, but it costs us $4,000 to hire and train somebody. On average, it costs us $4,000. So you're doing the math. If people aren't quitting, that's the money that we're still saving, that we're not losing. And, you know, back in the napkin math on here, it costs, it, it would cost me $1,000 to give somebody 50 cent raise and 50 cents to people um, that, that, that that's that, an extra thousand dollars is a lot. So it's cost me a thousand dollars a year to give someone 50 cents where if they quit, it costs us $4,000. So, so, you know, for the, the economics of it is the reason why that we're being able to succeed and grow and keep people. This is part of it is, 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 is looking at what these, what are these situations that where people are, people are leaving for um, that we've, we've found out. Um, and so another small thing, and this is another, this is another small thing that it was, it was a tip that my mentor told me too, is like, never give bad news on a Friday. So anytime having meetings, we never have like any meetings, we never schedule a meeting for the week after on a Friday, because then people are going to want, then the, the staff will wonder, what's this all about? They can't sleep, they're going to be stressed about it, all that stuff. So um, just reinforcing the fact of making sure that none of that, no, we don't, leave a conversation hanging in that sense where sending an email out so, you know create any of that stuff we would do we we would we would never do that on a friday um another piece too is that no volunteering we do this no volunteering ever don't feel as though that your time is not valued so what we what we've always done is someone said oh i decided to work this craft fair without you know the person providing Put it on your timesheet. No, I was doing it. It was just kind of put on your timesheet. It's, it's this as it gets down to that. I find out, I found out the small things. It's those small things where people feel as though I always want. I always want to make sure that the people that work at Green Mountain Support Services always feel as though they owe the agency. The agency doesn't owe them. So every time, every time we have someone who wants to volunteer or we just had somebody who said hey just you know i just brought my cure again i put it in the break room people can use it i'm like hey okay so are you donating it to us or are you giving it to us because we're gonna have to we're gonna pay for it it's used don't worry it's a gift no we're going to buy it from you then so it's a situation where we always want to make sure that we 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 value our employees time we value our employees resources and we value uh, um everything they that they, they they bring to the agency so that was another thing it's those small things where uh we inundate them with you know mugs and pens and some of these small tchotchkes that just kind of keep the ball rolling a bit where it's um it it, it gives it gives them that 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 point of that's it's the big things and it's the small things the big things is having a great health insurance policy we gave them that was that was another foundational piece. And that, that was a big investment putting on there to help us out too. The big things, the unlimited vacation, some of these things being part of committees. These are the big things that we give them to make sure that they do have that value and respect. Um, another thing we do as well is going back to the social media piece, um, connecting with small businesses, local businesses, and getting gift cards from them that we use to give to employees. And you know, getting a getting gift cards, getting gifts, or get any of those kind of small things we give to them, we then publicly acknowledge it. It helps out with the local businesses, and also helps out. Uh, it also helps out our our staff retention as well. Um, that was uh, another thing too. Is we're able to provide for our employees, uh, and if if you haven't done this for your agencies or or advice, is this is a good thing to do? Look at. First of all, check out the mission and values of these for-profit companies. If you find a if you find a for-profit company that you agree with their mission and values, whether they, you know I'm talking about car insurance companies, phone companies, different places that were able to provide group discounts for companies, you can get 10% off, 5% off, 25% off, depending, you know, looking at your AT&Ts, your car company, your your your. Uh, uh, car insurance places, your Geico's, your Liberty Mutual's, your AAA's, finding places that will provide those, those discounts, we found very helpful. 
uh, we were also able to find out we were able to give AAA for to all of our employees because we found out how inexpensive it was to do a group discount. So we were able to give that uh, at um, for free to our employees. Um, just adding on all those small tiny things, we were able to uh, um, we're able to definitely help out help out our employees as well. Um, and so, yeah, you'd be surprised of all these small things that you're able to kind of add on to the pile where you just. The, 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 I've noticed new employees get whiplash when they're going through their 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 new things. Like, all right, wait, how much? Wait, I got a two hundred dollars for taking time off. I get that. I get well. This is in the health insurance policy. I have this really good HRA card. Um, you know, there's I that takes care of all my copays. These are some of the these are some of the things where it you want people to stay because they like working there for the benefit, not because they feel like they have to stay because there is something banked that they're going to lose. When, some, when, when somebody comes to work for our agency, uh, we, we, we keep them because we want them to know that they're valued here and that everything that they, everything they have with them can go with them. Like our 403B, our 401k plan, that's theirs. We're, there's nothing that's, there's no saved up vacation time. There's none of that stuff. So there's nothing there that's holding any employees hostage. Feel like if I'm here for five more years, I get something else. So it's it's all those aspects that all these things that I've been talking about. Fast forward, you know, these some of these things we implemented recently. Some of these things. This is the reason why during the pandemic, I sent out as soon as we weren't sure what was happening in March 2020, I sent a thing out to everybody, and this they sent out a thing saying your job is safe. You'll get paid for as much as you're doing. You, you're, you're, you will get paid if you need to stay home. We'll still pay you. We will do that. I said that way before we knew there was going to be some COVID funding because I wanted to make sure because I knew if we had to lay anybody off, that is a that that that's so scary for folks knowing that this was happening and knowing that we had that our agency made the decision that we were going to keep everybody whole. Um, saved us. Other agencies who had to lay people off because they weren't sure what was happening. That investment, and then when you look, and this is the other piece of it, you look at how much people get paid per month and how much people are getting paid. The the amount, and we did the math on there, the amount of what we were going to lose wasn't that much because I wasn't looking based off of annual salaries. I was looking based off of what the paychecks were going to be every week. Um, and that was the that was the benefit of that is is knowing that we we respected them as people, we respected them as that, and we wanted them to um, have that security. And when we looked at this on the other, now all the things I've been saying for the last forty minutes, on the other side of that now with the with with COVID, where people are losing people left and right, and they can't hold anybody. And that was the other. That was the other. We and so to be very clear. The conversation I had with my HR director when we were coming out of this, I know people look for other jobs. I know it. They should. I mean, that we don't, that they should be looking. They should always compare us to other places. It's so important because that makes us better at it. Um, we, we had some of the hand thinking about going. Um, and what I, what, what I did was, you know, asking is like, what can we do? Well, you know what the pay is like, what I did is like, and this is the other thing that we're able to stop right away. You know, once the ball starts rolling, that's when other people start. When, once one person leaves, somebody else goes. And then you just start seeing other people jumping off. Uh, what I did was for the, you know, for, for fairness is like when I heard somebody was, and eh, I think about going and somebody I really wanted to stay. Um, I talked to them. I said, what do you need? I need, so what I was able to do is give them, you know, give them a, give them a raise give that person a raise enough for them to stay. It wasn't enough. That was, you know, it wasn't. Um, and the, that person stayed. And the, the beauty of it is, is that it's, it's kept our whole entire agency whole. Um, I've only did how to do it a couple of times. I had a few people, to be honest, I wasn't upset if they wanted to leave. So they're like, Hey, I'm thinking about going I'm like, ah, it's too bad. Okay. Well, Hey, I can write you a letter of recommendation, whatever you need. Uh, thinking I was going to we were going to give them a raise and they um when they found that they wasn't going to get one they stayed 
uh, because a little, a lot of the benefits that we had on there, it was, it was, it was that, it was that benefit. It was that, it was that ability to, to create that. So honestly, of all those things that we're doing, and, and I'm sure there's other, some of these other smaller things that I did is I, I, I wrote a whole list I can send to you, Sarah, of just kind of notes. Uh, but that's basically of where we were at. And this is where we're at now is if a lot of it is coming down from my, you know, from my perspective and my position was investing in those frontline workers and investing in those frontline workers. They did not quit because they did not quit. My, our middle management staff did not quit because they didn't have to in turn do the frontline work. So they all stayed. And it was looking at it from that front line is protecting that front line and making sure that they were solid and they, they felt supported um, really helped us out in the long run. So, yeah. So yeah, some questions, sorry, that was a, a lot of information. Yeah. Josh, I had a question in terms of um, just because I think sometimes the the challenge or balance is, you know, oh, we have like how large your budget and team size actually is to be able to financially provide for some of these things. Like some of them are sort of technically non-financial, but they do sometimes have financial implications for running organizations. So I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit, because I know smaller teams and smaller budgets have you know other sorts of opportunities that they could take advantage of or not right and, and some that's a great question Sarah and some of it is based off of um, creating that level playing field to ask the question of like what do you need you know so some people are like I just need to work from home and then the question is like well I mean you're you're you know you're, you're the front desk person I can't I don't know how we could but now they have these go-to connects where we've actually told our front desk person you can work from home if you want to. I can't. No one's going to like. So it's like, I said, what? Well, you could. If you, I mean, if you really wanted to, we could be able to. I mean, we, I, have a, I have a good friend of mine who actually is uh, the front desk operator for a veterinarian hospital out of Boston. And he's up here in Northern Vermont answering phones all day. So there is. So, so to, to, to answer that question, some people need the flexibility of home and work life. Some people might need that they're, they're they need to, you know, bring their, you know, we, before this, we had some, we said they, they brought their baby into work and we're like, it's fine. I mean, it's, I, like I said, it gets down to that point of like, we've always done it this way. So one of those pieces is looking, asking that question, well, because we've always done it this way. I'm like, well, why? So kind of figuring it out, you know, we had, so that was one of the benefits, you know, pre-pandemic is we had like three or four babies in the office and, you know, the you know, moms were able to bring their babies in and it was fine. You know, like it's, you know, we, we, we checked with our insurance companies like, oh, it's fine. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, you, you know, it's, so there's, I think that piece of it is like looking at if this, if it's not a financial, putting that on, you know, creating those non-starters and creating that, that, that transparency to say, can't do the money thing right now, but what else do you need? And it's, and, 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 and I've learned like the, the transparency and the information and making sure that somebody might say, I kind of need this instead. Uh, being flexible with that stuff, it's, uh, it's been a real challenge. And one of the questions that I, I, I was faced to, and I had some agent, I had somebody ask me, another director says, I could never do a limited vacation because like, you know, I, the staff would take advantage of it. And my question was, my response was like, if you hire staff you don't trust, why did you hire them? <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't understand why. I, I just, I've had zero people take advantage of an unlimited vacation policy. Um, we've had to reinforce the fact that people needed to take at least two weeks off. Um, we've been, the only enforcement we've ever had is making people take time off. Because it was one of those things where it was an abstract thought in the background. They could take time off anytime they wanted to. It was there. They stopped taking time off. So we had to reinforce it. So, you know, one piece is, as you said, Sarah, is like the financial piece is, is important. I would also look at, you'd, I, I, I was surprised when started to act, started to asking my accountant, our, our accountant to say, doing, you know, just asking to create some hypotheticals. 
with the idea of that four thousand dollars, or it could be two thousand, depending on whatever what, what, what situation you're in, there is a cost to hire people. So looking at what that cost is is already a cost that you don't put on your your P and Ls. It's not there to say, all right, we need a budget for people quitting. Uh, so that's not a that's not a budget in there. So so with that said, it's those it's those it's those soft costs that I see that as investing into your businesses, investing into your company is, is, I see those retention benefits, especially if that's a financial piece, as a, um, as a company expansion policy, not as retention, and not necessarily money you don't have, because we don't have money for people to quit anyway. So that was that, that's the piece of it. Yeah. Yeah, Annabelle, go ahead. I was going to say others <laughs> share, have questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, no, thank you, Josh. This has been really amazing and helpful. Um, it feels like a lot of this is tied to culture, too. And um, I'm curious on your thoughts, just um, in someone kind of more middle management, how um, go about kind of bringing up some of these conversations and I found here I've been here about two and a half years and the the mindset is very much if you're salaried the expectation is you're available you know we have operations seven days a week you're available seven days a week um you know you should be grateful basically to have this job um my manager has often said that her pto is basically just not joining meetings but still responding to all emails um I get emails all throughout the night and I think it's gotten worse during the pandemic where the the work, the boundaries are kind of not so much there. Um, and we've now, we're place-based organizations. So we're back a lot in the office. And, you know, if there's a day you can't be there for some reason, it's almost like you're ashamed for not being there. So I'm just wondering at what point to start to bring up these conversations and then at what point is it more of just the culture of the organization and maybe it's better it's time to find something that's more aligned. Because um, I think we're at this time where it's kind of, people are reverting back to maybe trying to revert back to beforehand. And there's this idea of um, feeling grateful you have a job, but um, also trying to have set boundaries with not having it being put, uh, turned against you that you're not as committed to the organization for some reason. Right. And that's a great point, Annabelle. And it's, you know, people. this is the point people are talking about. I can't wait till things get back to normal. My response was like, normal was horrible. Why would we go back to where we were before? Like, I was like, so like, you know, the, the, the piece of it as you, as, you, as, uh, as you brought up is like, there was, before I got here, the culture of Greenmount Support Services was very much like that. Like, we are mission driven. We are so, it's so important what we do, what we, the work we do is important. And when you, were, when you create an irreplaceable position, you become, you can't go anywhere because you're irreplaceable. So it also stops you there. And that, that piece that you're asking about with that, you know, how to, it's, it's those, it's that question, like when I was bringing up before, is that we've always done it like this way, so, but why? I mean, asking that question, why was it like that before? And, and it's so, you'd be so surprised. And this is the other piece too, is like, it's kind of, one of the other things we're introducing and it's kind of parallel to what you're talking about, Annabelle, is I am, we're going to start doing the four-day work week. And I've gotten pushback from staff who say, I got it. I, I might, I've, been, I've been working for five days. I got my calendar. I got everything planned out. And the piece of it is the, uh, the, the, the question about especially the salaried staff is like, uh, well, I work so many hours. I'm like, first of all, the 40-day work, you know, the 40-hour work week, the five-day a week, is a vestige of a Henry Ford factory model. It doesn't need to exist anymore, so get rid of it. And so thinking about you have work to do, you have work to do, do your job. When your work is done, go home. You don't have to fill it in in a 40 hour work week in this mentality of like, you have to be there. Uh, we saw, we saw it very much in that pandemic is that um, it's, you know, we saw very much in that pandemic is the the idea of you can work remotely. There, it is possible, to, and it's just getting back to this 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 mindset. And I and as I said, I got pushback from our middle management folks. Who goes, I can't do this. Can we opt out of the out of the four day work week? And my response is like, I'm going to say this. 
with love in my heart, give it a try. Try it. And if it, we're going to try it for six months, fail fast. We have fail fast mentality. We're going to try it. If it doesn't work, we'll go back to what we were doing before. But I said, with love in my heart, I, I am asking you to work four days a week and still get paid the same amount of money. And the work's still going to be here. How many times have we thought, it's like when you get on, we go on vacation and it's like, well, I still check my email because they don't want all that email there. What I did, oh, here's another tip. I got this idea, another beautiful Harvard Business Review article. It was what I, what I posted. And it's not fair. If you, and I got to say this. It's not fair if you don't post this for yourself and the people that expect an email. My out of office reply email says, I'm taking time off from this point to this point. Uh, when I come back, I will batch delete all my emails from this period. And if it's important, please email, email me after when I come back. And if it's important that needs to be addressed, please send it to blah, 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 whoever that is. Because we all get so, so that's the point is like, turn off your email. And it's so hard because here's the, that your family and your friends are way more important. And I'm talking in generalities. In my experience, my family and my friends are way more important to me than my job. So being able to have an organization shackle you to a position is not fair to you and it's not fair to the agents because they they the agency itself as an entity um isn't there it's, it's so that's i don't know animal did i answer your question i was kind of going off yeah no thank you yes no no it's helpful no i appreciate it it's it's yeah. true thank yeah. you Awesome. Well, we have one more minute left, um, but if there aren't any more questions, we can wrap, you know, 30 seconds early. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just want to thank Josh, you again, you again for sharing all of your expertise. It's a lot of information. Um, we'll be sharing sort of a recap email. And um, if you do have those lists that you mentioned, uh, please send them our way so we can share them with everyone who RSVP'd for the call as well. Um, and also too, like Josh is a member, obviously a lot of you on the call are members. So feel free to reach out to him. And this is part of sort of the membership community of commuters.org is that exchange and, and sharing of knowledge and resources. Um, and then, yeah, Josh, if you can share your LinkedIn profile before we head yeah, out, let me, let me pull it up. It's my, uh, I do, uh, uh, one of my, one of my hobbies is I'm, uh, as I say, I do, uh, I, uh, Artist, so I did, I did, like I said, I do a lot of cartoons. So most of my uh, my LinkedIn profile is my my personal one. So like I do like a I do a podcast where I interview like children's book artists and like cartoonists and stuff too. So um, awesome. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I click? Okay, here it is. So here it is. Um, and so my nom de plume is Barney Smith. So just so uh, <laughs> I'll send it my LinkedIn. I'm sorry, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone who was able to join the call today um, and for your contributions and just listening in and, and participating in the chat um, and just hope to hear from all of you again soon. So thank you again for connecting and look forward to connecting again at some point. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, everybody.